We are in Philippians chapter two. And I noticed this, I get the, the chapter with a lot of theology in it. I'm sure it was just by accident, but it's gonna be tough going today. I actually even told my family that I'm not quite sure how I'll get through today without ugly crying, not just tears like I usually do, but the ugly kind of crying where it's like, oh my goodness, I need. So if I do that, could you just amen or something to kind of cover this? So those people at home aren't wondering what is going on in that place. It will be me uh, manifesting my gratefulness to God. So let's get started. Are we ready? Philippians chapter two. I absolutely love going through the scriptures like we're doing this month because it is so powerful to just read the words of the Bible out loud, to just read them over us uh, brings a blessing and brings a power to our lives that comes from opening up the word of God and believing it as truth. That, that makes a powerful thing activated in our life. And we love that. So Philippians chapter two, we're gonna start. <clears throat> Let's see here. I won't flip it yet because we start right into the words because there are 30 verses in this chapter. We're gonna get through it, so do not be faint of heart. We're gonna skip past some of them and just, just read, and then some of them we're gonna stop, especially the parts that might be a little bit more difficult theologically to understand, myself included. So let's start by saying, when chapter two opens, Paul is, obviously there weren't the chapter breaks as he was writing this letter, but he opens talking about four privileges that we have as believers, those that are united in Christ. And what that means is, how many of us, when we turned 15, the moment we turned 15, I know we have um, a grandson that's gonna be turning 15 soon, and he's already talking about getting his restricted license. That's on his, that's on his brain. Everything he's doing is to get his restricted license. And how many of us, the moment we were able to legally apply, we were down there. And we had all kinds of excuses like, mom, I'll go get milk for you, I'll go run errands for you, whatever you need, and that lasted about, what, maybe two weeks when they got their license before they were, bing, gone. But, so every parent, every good parent gets the, gives the speech. Now this is a privilege, this is not a right. You have to wait until you're 18 to give it unless I say you can have it now. And you, there's no texting, there's no drinking, there's no having alcohol. There's a whole list of responsibilities that we say come with that privilege. Am I right, parents? And we give them the speech every time they leave for the first year of, of their driving life. So, but we know as we get older and we are allowed to walk in more privileges that each privilege comes with the responsibility. And if we're not willing to do the responsibility, if we're not willing to say, okay, mom, you know, I really think I will text and drive, but I'm gonna go ahead and get my license. We're like, no, if you can't swear to me on the life of your children that you will not text and drive, that you will not have alcohol in your car, that you will not whatever, then you're not, you're not gonna have this privilege. I'm not gonna let you, I'm not taking you down there paying this insurance if you're not gonna say, I accept the responsibility, correct parents? All right, so Paul says, <clears throat> when we are united in Christ, we have four privileges. So we're gonna step right in, get right into it. <clears throat> Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, now remember he's talking with people that are believers, that are like-minded with him. If there's any comfort from his love, <clears throat> if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion. So those are four privileges that we as believers have when we are united in Christ. And if you think about it, we've all partaken of encouragement from the Lord. You know those times when you're just really down, when you think, I, 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 can, can I go through another battle? Can I face another giant? Can I have another argument? Can I be out of relationship any longer? When we're going through those times, the Spirit of God Himself encourages us, strengthens us. 
And, he, and Paul is saying, so that he's saying, if you have any, and don't read that like, if you have any, read that like, since you have, because that's what it's really saying in this scripture. Since you have encouragement from being united with Christ, that's a privilege that we have that people who are not united with Christ don't have. Yes, they can get encouragement from friends. Yes, they can get encouragement from their mama and their daddy. But encouragement from the Spirit of God, that is a privilege reserved for those who trust in God. If there's any comfort from his love. Now, how many of us in the last, since this year began, have received comfort from someone in the body? Raise your hand whether you've received a meal or you've received solace or you've received, but there's comfort that comes from being united with Christ. Not just the comfort from his spirit, because one of the names of the Holy Spirit is comforter, but the comfort that comes from the body of Christ. This is a privilege that we have. If there's any common sharing in the spirit, this is what Pastor Peter was referring to last week when he talked about the koinonia, that, that, that fellowship that we feel when we gather together. That's why when the door was open, I got my mask. If I have to wear a plastic bubble, I will wear a plastic bubble. I don't care. I want to be together with the saints. I want to be together with my sisters. I want to be together with my brothers because there is something that happens when we are in koinonia with each other. And it was referred to last week. And if there's any tenderness and compassion. Tenderness and compassion from God's heart to our heart. To pick us up. To bolster us. To say, you can do it another day. You're going to be okay. My spirit and my people will go together and we'll face this. If there's any of that, if you've experienced that or since you have experienced that. So those are some of the privileges. Now, is this all the privileges we have? No, but this is just some as he's writing a letter. You know, you don't say everything you know in the letter. <clears throat> but now he's going to give us three responsibilities. If we're allowed these privileges, what are our responsibilities as children of God, as people that are united together? <clears throat> then make my joy complete by being, what does it say? Those of you at home, like-minded. Having the same love. Okay, so the first thing is we have to be like-minded. That is no easy task, even for a husband and a wife. Can I get a witness, somebody out there besides me and Pastor Mark? Yes. Being like-minded on goals for your children, on, on lessons they should take after school on what instruments, just simple things to be like-minded, to be walking the same path with the person you've chosen, that's tough enough. But to be like-minded with all the brothers and the sisters, that doesn't mean we all think the same. That doesn't mean we all do the same thing. That means that we are all united in our, in our desire, in our goal, in our passion to see God's kingdom come, to see God's will done here on earth. We are like-minded. The same love, having the same love. Have you ever been in a relationship where the person, uh, this is before you're married, hopefully, when you're dating, all those hundreds of people you dated, I think I dated like maybe two boys, one really for sure, but before Pastor Mark, I mean, he thought we were engaged and I somehow let him think that. I don't know how that worked, but anyway, I'm still living that one down. But have you ever, hypothetically, been in a relationship where that person liked you more than you liked them? Anybody else? I see those hands out there. It's miserable because you feel like a fraud. You feel like, I'm cheating this person. Or the other way around, you love them much more than they were willing to reciprocate. That's a bad feeling on whatever end of that equation you're on. So God is saying a responsibility that you have as a child of God 
being united together is to have the same love. You love them with a fervor and a passion and they love you with that same passion for God, that same passion for one another. They have the same love. Not one of you lukewarm and one of you zealous, but both of you zealous for the things that make God smile. Having the same spirit and of one mind. <clears throat> All right. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. I don't even know what to do with this one because, you know, I just barely got past the first two verses and now here we are. Selfish ambition is I am going to put myself forward. I am going to put my agenda first. I don't care how it affects you, and I don't care how it affects those that I love or those that love me. That is selfish ambition. There's nothing wrong with ambition. <clears throat> ambition meaning there's a goal and a prize and a purpose, and I'm going to go toward that goal. To me, that's just being single-minded. That, that version of ambition. But selfish ambition isn't about the kingdom of God. It's about you. And I am going to do what I have to do to see that this takes place. <clears throat> I'm going to do what I have to do to see that my purpose is achieved. <clears throat> or vain conceit. Now, we all know what conceit means and we all know what vain, con vain means. So vain conceit is then when you have a much higher opinion of yourself, then you should. You have a much higher estimation of your own, not, and it's not value because we, we understand that as children of God, we are valuable. We are so valuable that Jesus died and we're gonna talk about that at length in just a moment. <clears throat> but when you consider yourself and your goals and what you need to be more than the next person, when you consider yourself higher than you ought. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. That's a tough, that's a tough gig. That's, um, that takes something of the Spirit of God moving in our heart to put someone else's interests above our own. <clears throat> I keep referring to marriage because that's kind of the, 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 the relationship where the rubber hits the road for most people. Not to say that, that single people or, or widowed people or uh, you know, other sorts of people don't have trouble with this, but when you're married and you happen to be living together, there's that rub. And then add six months of quarantine on top of that. My, 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 Jesus, help us. Our, we're all still married. Is, is an act of God. And not in, in jail, needing to be... You see, my husband isn't here today. <laughs> He's actually on, on a trip with my brother. So we might be bailing them out of jail later on with those two. Who knows? But anyway... <clears throat> Now, those two things, selfish ambition, vain conceit, go under the heading of pride. And you remember, as Christians, as mature believers that we are, that heading of pride is the source of all evil thoughts, all evil desires. And so, selfish ambition and vain conceit come under that heading. And if you will recall, those two things under the heading of pride is what got Satan out of heaven, because he said, I'm going to ascend. I'm going to, I'm going to go up. Why is God better than me? Can you imagine? Can you fathom that this <clears throat> created being said, I'm going to take the throne. People are going to worship me. I deserve this. And pride is so ugly. Pride is so destructive in a relationship because this whole chapter is about how to be in relationship with each other, specifically Christian to Christian, but it's also how we walk and carry ourselves through this world. 
But that pride, that selfish ambition and vain conceit is so ugly that God says, I oppose the proud person. I don't care if you're a believer. I don't care. If you have that conceited pride, if you think you deserve, God says, I oppose that and I oppose you. He resists the proud. He'll turn his face away from proud actions. I don't want that. I know the Apostle Paul who wrote this um, letter struggled with pride. When, if we notice the first letters that he wrote, he had a very different tone than the ones that we're reading today. <clears throat> he went out to great length to talk about he was the super apostle, his credentials, the best of the best. In fact, pride was such a part of his life in the early days that when he was, was with Barnabas, and remember Barnabas is called, he was such an encourager, he was actually called the son of encouragement. How would you like to have that nickname? You're such an encourager. I'm going to call you the daughter of encouragement. But he, Paul struggled with pride in those early days. And so John Mark made a mistake. As a young believer, he, he made a cowardly decision. And who among us has not said something that we needed to say for Christ? Has not stood in the breach for someone that needed it? So Paul said, you know what? He left us. I'm not traveling with him anymore. And Barnabas pleaded with Paul and said, look, please, he, give him another chance. And Paul's like, no, no. And so it, the disagreement was so severe that they parted company. Barnabas taking John Mark and Paul picking another traveling companion. But if you keep reading through the letters that Paul wrote, the older he got, the more seasoned he got the more battle scars he received in service of Jesus. His letters changed. His tone changed. And as he would write the different churches, he said, I am the least. Of all the apostles, I am the least. I am a servant. I am a slave to the Most High God. And as such, I will be a servant to any one of you that need me. And in one letter, he actually said, find, find John Mark. Find him. Bring him to me. Bring him to me. I need him. I need him. He has much work to do for the gospel. Humility that we're going to see that Jesus displayed, how it works in our heart and changes that vain conceit, that imagining that we're better than we are, more than we are, changes it till we have a true picture of who we are, who God is. Are you still with me? Are you with me? Are you, are you with me at home? Oh, that was loud. I heard you. Okay, and you're thinking, how is she going to finish? We're only on verse four. Hold on to your hairpins, people. Here we go. Here's the difference in pride. Pride walks into a room and says, here I am, you lucky people. Or pride or humility walks in and goes, oh, Beth, there you are. I've been waiting to see you. I've got questions to ask you. That's the difference. Here I am. Oh, there you are. There you are. Wow, I've missed you. I could say that about every one of you after this COVID kerfuffle. I've missed you all. Humility, humility, humility is the grief that keeps relationships together. Humility. It's not how smart you are. It's not how much money you have. It's humility. Can you say, you know what? I need your help. I don't understand that. I need to be humility. So how, so how in the world do we get a proper estimation of who we are? We know we're daughters of God. We know we're sons of God. We know we're servants of the Most High. But how, where does that fit in the hierarchy of what we believe about ourselves? How, what is our template 
for humility. So Paul's going to give us two examples. Let's go quickly. In your relationships with one another. So the whole rest of the chapter is talking about how we relate one to another. And I don't know about you, but I need this, not just information. I need this life to be imparted so that I can stay in right relationship with you. So that my desires and my, my thoughts don't go wild, wild and way afield. I need this. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. Well, there you go. All right. We can all do that, right? Have the same mindset. Okay. Now, he is going to go to great pains here, and I'm going to take the time to explain what that mindset actually cost Jesus. Because if, uh, for me, I, I focus on the, the, the horrors of the cross and the suffering that he did on the cross. And I kind, of, I kind of gloss over, well, he left glory, came to earth, came as a man. I kind of gloss over that. It's not that I don't know or don't believe, but I, I, I need to know what God wants us to know about his story, how he came to do what he did for me and for you. And so he starts by saying this, have this mindset, Watch what Jesus does, and you copy that, and your relationships with one another, it's going to be okay. So, who being in very nature, God? Okay. This is part of it. This whole, the next five or six verses is some, honestly, some deep theology. And there's a lot of people that don't, don't get it. I mean, there's a lot to understand. And by the time we get through, we're going to go, I still don't get it. But here's the thing I want you to remember. It's not that we understand how God did it all. It's that we believe that God did it all. Do you understand me? Are, you, are we on the same page? So there might be a point where you go, I don't really understand how that can be. Well, right, because we're human and we're not divine. We're not omniscient. We don't know everything, but we do know that we're called to believe this. So who being in very nature, God did not consider equality with God, something to be used to his own advantage. So here we have Jesus who, as we, as we know, basic understanding, he and the son, or the father and the Holy Spirit are one. They are all God. There's not one that's less God than the other. They are all God. So Jesus in very nature. So the people that say, well, Jesus wasn't really God. He was, you know, he was like God. He was God's son, but he wasn't God. He was God in very nature. What does it say? God in very nature, God. So you have Jesus who is in glory, surrounded, covered in majesty. He is God. We don't make him a lesser God because he's the son. He is God. And it's hard to wrap our mind around how God can have three distinct people and be one God, but it is so. Did not consider equality with God. I'm trying to make sure I explain this in a way that we all get it. There is a there is a majesty and a glory that is inherent in the nature of God, along with all the other attributes of justice and, and being all powerful and all those things, but a majesty and a glory that is inherent in God. And Jesus, it says here, didn't, didn't try to hold on to that glory, didn't try to hold on to that majesty. We just kind of think, well, he just became a man. But what did he become a man from? Perfection, angels upon angels attending him. All of these things, he divested himself of that, that, that nature for a time, for a temporary time, so that my redemption could be purchased. Can you just allow yourself to think of that? All that is inherent in the nature of God, Jesus divested himself of that. He laid it aside and he put on himself the manifestation of a man. I, I am blown away by that. Rather, he made himself nothing 
by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. We say, well, being a man is not nothing compared to God, compared to who he was, who he still is, but for a time. Because when he became a man, let me see if I need to go to the next verse too. Not yet. When he temporarily did that, stepped into being born as a man, as a baby, what, what family was he born into? He left glory, came as a man, came as a baby in a humble place from a, a, an unwed mother, despised. He, he's in a family, he's disregarded. He has no distinction. So he took the form of a man, made himself nothing. That's what it means. He took the form of a man, but in a family that was, had no distinction, in a family that people disregarded him. They were, they were not powerful. They were not. So he voluntarily made himself a man. Subject now to sickness, subject now to hunger, subject now to thirst. Subject now to every infirmity, every condition known to man. He voluntarily put that manifestation on, that form. He is now God and man, being made in human likeness. Taking the nature of a servant. Not, I, I was thinking to... He didn't use his relationship with God to an advantage. He didn't say, you know what? I'm, I, I'm, I am God. I'm, I'm, why aren't you? And how many times do I use relationships for an advantage to get an edge? Oh, I know that person. Well, that person knows me. But Jesus didn't use his oneness with God to his advantage. But rather for you and for me, he laid it aside. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. One of the highest honors that we see God has shown through Jesus is his obedience to the law. You know, sometimes we think, well, these laws are just for you know, people that don't know better. And, you know, in the New Testament, it's just we got to love each other. We got to love God, and that's our law. But law, the, the, the laws that he has in his book, in the New Testament, they're so important. They are so important that Jesus, who was also the giver of the law, submitted himself to those laws. And the Old Testament law says that if your sins are to be forgiven, a sacrifice must be made. And that sacrifice must contain blood. And Jesus, who himself gave that law, submitted himself, was obedient to that law, and became the sacrifice for our sins. That is tremendous. He didn't just leave heaven and one day he woke up as a baby and then he went to the cross and then the horror of the... This is what he did for you. This is what he did for me. Death, even death on a cross. Now we have so, I've started the last couple of months wearing a, a cross on my wrist. I think, well, that seems kind of super religious, but not to me. Because when I look down, I see, I'm reminded. I'm reminded no matter where I am, if I'm at Publix and I'm whatever, if I'm, I'm reminded of what he did. This is my line in the sand, people. It's not about race for me. It's not about politics for me. It's about this. This is my line in the sand. This is what I'm about 24-7. If, 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 this, if this furthers God's kingdom, sign me up. If it doesn't further God's kingdom, I don't have time for it. That's just the way I am. That, this is a reminder. But in Jesus' day, this was a symbol of horror. Horror. The worst way you could die. And so when he came as a man, humbled himself without distinction, without honor, how many of us can go without honor at all in our life? Without being shown deference. And he died on the cross. So for us, it's been sanitized. And 
for them. When his family saw him die, it wasn't an honorable thing. It was a shameful thing. It meant their dreams and their hopes were dead. So he was obedient to death on the cross. Therefore, God has exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, under the earth. What in the heck does under the earth mean? Every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. I have no idea where I am in my notes, so I'm just going to keep going. I have five minutes. Buckle up. All right. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Every tongue confess. Now, some people, you know how Paul would write some of his letters and say, you know, I'm writing you this because there are some people that have come in and told you things that aren't true and you're starting to believe them. Don't believe that because this is the truth. Well, this is one of those things. People today, I've heard pastors, God help them, say, well, every person is actually eventually going to be saved because it says here that every tongue is going to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. So that means everyone, that is not true. That's not what this verse means. That's why it's important to put things in context. This verse means that there is coming a day when the end of everything is here and and the Lord returns. There is coming a day. Now, those of us that have received the sacrifice that have said the the, the cross made a difference in my life and this is what it means to me, those of us, we're going to be shouting, Jesus is Lord. We acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. But there are people from Adam on that are alive, that will be alive in that day, that have died. And that's why those that that are under the earth, the fallen angels, there's going to be a day when we're all together. And Jesus is going to be the one that will say, your fate is sealed. When he says it to me, because of the sacrifice, I can say, thank you, Jesus. My fate is sealed. I live with you for eternity. But for those that never said, uh, Jesus isn't Lord. He, this is stupid that you believe someone lived a sinless life. That is ridiculous. There are more than one way. There is more than one way to God. More than one way. And, and I, think, I think Buddha is just the same. And I think this, this prophet is just the same. Those people are going to be compelled by God to say, I acknowledge. They're going to be compelled to bow their knee. And they're going to acknowledge. That doesn't mean they're going to believe it in their heart. They're going to be raging against God, but they'll be compelled to say it. And Jesus will assign them their faith. Therefore, my friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God who works in you to will and to act in accordance to fulfill his good purpose. Here's fallacy number two. People have used this verse to say, see, you got to do a lot of works. And if you don't do enough works, you're not going to be. But we know that's not what he's saying. Paul is saying to the Philippians, look, this is serious business. And I can't walk the walk for you. I can't do it for you. You have to accept Christ for yourself. And as you walk out salvation in your life, as you walk forward and and how you respond to people who hate you, how you respond to people that praise you, how you respond to your wife, how you respond to your husband, how you train your children, those are the things that will show if you really believe what you say you believe. That's what he means. And when he says fear and trembling, that doesn't mean we need to be afraid of God. That means that this is serious business. This is eternity. And I know we've heard it said, you know, the most important decision you can make is is your spouse or your house. I'm here to tell you this is more important. And that's why he says with fear and trembling, this is eternity. My mom used to tell us when we were little, 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 that God has no grandchildren. He doesn't. He has sons and he has daughters. And he said, and she would say to us, you're too young now, but from a little child, we heard this. There is coming a day that you will have to make that decision for yourself. So mama can pray, mama can plead, mama can intercede, but each of us has to make that decision ourselves. And it's an important decision. It is an eternal decision. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. I could, we we don't have, yeah, let's keep going. So that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped, crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly 
to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain, but even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. So he's given us two examples, Jesus and now himself. He said, I'm willing to do whatever I have to do. I'm going to pour my entire life out if it means you will be walking and be found in the faith. But for those of us who are just sitting here on the 21st century, those are some pretty high examples. I mean, come on. So he gives us two more. He gives us Timothy and Epaphroditus. So as we read and finish up here, we need to understand that, that, that the things he says about these are how these men walked in humility, serving Paul and serving the Lord. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I may also be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out to their own interests not those of Jesus Christ. But you know, Timothy has proved himself. These are traits of faithful friends. Because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope therefore to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. Finishing up here. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus my brother, my coworker, my fellow soldier. Those are the, that's the friendships that I want with me. I want a sister to walk by my side. I want a co-laborer to do things for God that, that bear fruit together. I want a fellow soldier, someone that will suffer with me and still move forward with me in our service to the God who loved me so deeply who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you have heard that he is ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. You know why he was ill? It was, it was 800 miles, give or take, from Philippi to where, to where Paul was imprisoned in the Roman jail. 800 miles, and he was carrying supplies because remember, as Pastor said last week, those Roman jails were, were not for sissies. You, you had to provide your own food, your own medicine, your own clothing. And if, he, if Epaphroditus had not come with those things from the Philippians, then Paul would have gone without. So 800 miles he traveled with supplies to care for Paul in prison. That's amazing to me. No wonder he got sick. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him. And not only him, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow, thinking that he had lost another friend. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. So then welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help that you yourselves could not give me. He's saying, look, you couldn't all make that 800 mile journey to Rome, but he did. And the word risk there is the only time it's used in that way in the entire Bible because it means gambled. He gambled with his life, believing he could make it, believing he could stay, believing he could help Paul. He gambled when he had no guarantees. He had no assurances. There were no insurance policies, no planes, no trains, no automobiles. He did it and he is worthy of honor. So let me ask you in closing to think about something. Can you remember who was, I'm going to ask you several questions as we close. Can you remember who won, and don't answer out loud, just check it off in your mind if you know this answer or not. Who won best director for a picture in the year 2018? Who in our country has, what man or woman has the highest IQ of any other person? What woman, and I'll be embarrassed if you know this one, what woman won Miss Universe last year? If you're like me, I didn't know the answer to any of these questions. I just thought of questions I didn't know the answer to. But let me ask you another question. Can you name one teacher growing up that influenced you 
in a good way. Mine was Mrs. Thompson in the third grade. Can you remember one teacher? Can you name two friends that walked by your side in a really difficult time? A time you didn't know if you were going to make it. Can you name two friends? Can you name the person of someone that is a personal hero? Because their story is so brave. It's so compelling. The reason why you name, can name the last three questions and most probably can't the first two or three is because the last three are people that cared about you, that genuinely cared for your welfare. The last three are people that walked with you, walked alongside you. They practiced humility to the point that they made a significant difference in your life. Would you stand with me, please? I just want us to think for just a moment and allow the Holy Spirit to talk with us. Are we people that are using relationships for our own advantage? Trying to leverage something out of this relationship when Jesus himself said, I'm not going to use this as an advantage relationship I have with a father that cannot be broken. I'm not going to leverage that to get out of redeeming sons and daughters. He's given us examples of humility that, I, that I, I, I'm still trying to wrap my, my mind around. But he said, this is how I want you to live as my daughter and as my son. This is how I want you to be. Putting someone else above yourself showing genuine concern, getting in there, in the battle with them, fighting the good fight. So I'm asking that the Lord will give us courage, give us new eyes, and tenderize our heart so that we can be more like His Son. So let this mind be in me. Let those actions be in you. So Father, we ask right now that your words will penetrate, that your words will pierce, that your words will heal and comfort, and that you will cause us to work and to will what you have planned for our lives, what you have planned for this church, God. Father, we resist the temptation to put ourselves first, to leverage a relationship for our own value, our own gain. Father, we repent from times that we have been ashamed of your name and that we didn't want to be ostracized. We didn't want to be without distinction. We didn't want to be without honor. If it meant we had to say we were your followers. Father, forgive us. Forgive us. You're looking for sons and daughters and brothers and sisters who look like you. So Father, I'm asking for everyone in this room, for everyone watching at home, for everyone that will see this during the week, may the peace of God fill your heart. May you have new, renewed zeal to be a bond servant to God. May we take on the attributes of our brother who didn't consider equality with God something that he would hold on to but he divested himself and put on our form so that we could live with you eternally. Father, thank you. May your peace be on your brothers and sisters. May your health be in our bodies. And may your courage fill us this week to do the things you've called us to do. And everyone said around this building, amen. Amen? Amen.